are going to, I guess we're going to get started. Um, my name is Amanda Sauls, and I'm this year's president of the Texas Federal Society. The Federal Society is a national network comprised of conservative and libertarian attorneys, judges, scholars, and students. And as a student chapter, the Texas Federal Society promotes freedom, federalism, and the rule of law. And we do so through facilitating debates and discussion within the law school community. Um, our author team is really excited about um, all of the new 1Ls and um, returning 2Ls and 3Ls that have signed up for FedSoc this year. Um, it is not too late, though, to sign up or to pay your dues to reactivate your membership. Um, Austin Black, right up there, will be able to help you after the event to get you signed up, um, to tell you a little bit about the 1L prep, prep program, if you're interested in learning about that, as well as buying a t-shirt as well for this year. Please buy a t-shirt. $10. Um, today, we're going to get started on our debate, which is on the role of the judiciary, and we're going to be talking about judicial restraint versus judicial engagement. And we hand it over to Ashley Travis, our VP of Speakers, to introduce our panelists. All right, we are very fortunate today to have with us two great speakers. Um, we have Sheldon Gilbert. Uh, Sheldon Gilbert is the director for the, of the Institute for Justice's Center for Judicial Engagement, which he joined in 2017. As CJE's director, he educates the public about the proper role of judges in enforcing constitutional limits on the size and scope of government. Before joining IJ, Sheldon worked as a litigator for the U.S. Chamber, Chamber Litigation Center, where he represented the Chamber in over 400 cases in federal and state courts, addressing a host of important business law issues from property rights to free speech, including nearly 100 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He graduated with honors from the George Washington University School of Law in 2008, and he received his under undergraduate degree in history from the University of Utah. We also have with us Brantley Starr. Brantley Starr is the Deputy First Assistant Attorney General for the Attorney General of Texas, a position he has held since May 2016. Previously, he has served as Staff Attorney to Justice Eva Guzman in the Texas Supreme Court, Associate at King & Spalding in Austin, where he focused on commercial and appellate litigation, and Assistant Solicitor General in the Office of the Attorney General, where he worked directly with then Solicitor General Ted Cruz. He also spent a year clerking for the Texas Supreme Court Justice Don Willett. Brantley graduated from the University of Texas School of Law in 2004, where, where he served as Editor-in-Chief of the Texas Review of Law and Politics and received his BA from Abilene Christian University. Please help me in welcoming our speakers. <laughs> showed up and, and Brantley uh, was chugging away as Dr. Pepper and so I casually pulled my Dr. Pepper I was toting with me out of my bag um, and I was delighted to see we have so much in common. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I just heard the, uh, the crazy story that um, some of the uh, other groups on, on campus are boycotting this event because uh, Chick-fil-A is here. Um, you know, I, I actually had this long period of my life when I also boycotted Chick-fil-A. Um, uh, as an undergrad, as a freshman at University of Utah, I, I bought the student meal plan, right? Except, uh, you know, at University of Utah, like, nobody lives in the dorms. Like, nobody lives on campus. It's very much a commuter school. And they shut down all of the food options except one, Chick-fil-A. So for an entire semester, I had Chick-fil-A for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And by the time I was done with my first semester of undergrad, I'm like, never again! <laughs> never will I eat Chick-fil-A again! Um, but eventually, the, the, the sweet smell of Chick-fil-A brought me back. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you for that very gracious introduction. And, and I'm excited to talk with you about the proper role of the courts in protecting economic liberty, liberties. Uh, as you heard, I spent a decade suing the federal government over regulatory overreach. And you can call me biased, but I think suing the government is hands down one of the most rewarding legal careers you could possibly have. <laughs> uh, and if that sounds fun to you, uh, that's right. Uh, I've got my, my colleagues at the Institute for Justice who are on the front row there. Um, uh, to, to razz me, not support me. Um, but if, uh, if suing the, the government sounds like a fun career to you, uh, after this is all over, come and talk with one of us, and we'd love to, to tell you how to build a career like that. But, you know, one thing I've learned litigating against the government is that we have far too many judges who feign constitutionalism during confirmation hearings and then feign it upholding the Constitution once they're on the bench. Now, you know, I'm just a simple country boy from Idaho, and so, you know, call me old-fashioned, but I want judges that have the Constitution to enforce the Constitution once they're on the bench. Um, at IGA, we have a specific name for this type of judging. We call it judicial engagement. Now, I've actually co-litigated a lot of federal government overreach cases with the Texas Attorney General's Office. So we've been in the trenches together suing the federal government. Uh, so I'm really delighted to have Brantley Starr here with me today. 
Um, and few know as well as the Texas Attorney General's Office just how hard it is to win a challenge to federal overreach in federal courts. And that's because of all of these Supreme Court precedents like Chevron deference that unconstitutionally require judges to defer to the government's legal and factual arguments. Uh, some years ago when the late Justice Scalia was visiting my alma mater, um, he said that as important as the U.S. Supreme Court is though, quote, the fact is if you ask which court is of the greatest importance to an American citizen, it isn't my court, it is that citizen's state court. Uh, so today, Grantley and I are going to talk about the proper role of state courts under state constitutions to preserve our economic liberties. In particular, Grantley and I are going to talk about our different perspectives regarding a recent Texas Supreme Court case called Patel versus Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. By show of hands, who's familiar with the Patel case? Is anybody familiar? So we've got a handful of folks. Um, <laughs> IJ, which litigated. Y'all are? What? <laughs> surprisingly, did not raise their hands. Uh, Bert, Bert gets three points for raising his hand, but everybody else is out. Um, but I want to make the case that nearly every court in America could learn a thing or two from the Texas Supreme Court about the proper role of judges in protecting our economic liberties. Um, but if you'll indulge me, I want to take a, a way back machine to when I was in my early 20s. Um, and I lived in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. <coughs> And Brazil has this thing called a, a carteira de trabalho, which means a, a worker's card. And it, it kind of looks like a passport booklet, and you open it up, and it lists all the occupations you're allowed to perform uh, if you're a worker. And if, if you're caught working without your carteira on you, you actually could go to jail. Like, they'll put you in prison for, for up to three months. Even if you have a carteira, but you just didn't bring it with you, you can go to jail for like three months, right? So as a 20-something Idaho rube, I kind of smugly thought, you know, in America, we don't need to get the government's permission to work. And I was you know, kind of very smug about this, right? Well, the sad truth is we are becoming more and more of a cartina society ourselves. So if you go back in time to the 1950s, only 5% of workers needed government permission to pursue a particular occupation. Today, somewhere between 1 in 4 and 1 in 3, depending on the numbers, um, workers need a license to work. Uh, these occupational licenses are, are basically government permission to work in a particular field. Um, who here is familiar with public choice economic theory? Do we have any uh, uh, proto-economists in the room? Uh, okay, IJ folks. Uh, 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 well, let me explain how it works. Uh, just I'll give you an example. Let's say you're an interior designer in Florida. And there are a lot of interior designers, and, and you want to figure out um, how to uh, run your business. And you've got kind of two options, either A, you can compete by being a better interior designer, better marketing, that kind of stuff. Or B, you can get the government to block anybody else from becoming an interior designer, right? That's public choice economic theory. You, you can script the government to block other folks from entering your field, right? And we, we sometimes call it crony capitalism or things like that. And the thing is, the bigger government gets, the more attractive crony capitalism as an, as, as an alternative to competition looks, right? So, this rise in occupational licensing makes sense when you map it alongside the rise in the size and scope of government. So the bigger the government gets, the more attractive it looks. So let me give you a few examples. In Utah, where I was born, the barber, comma, cosmetology, slash barber, comma, aesthetics, comma, electrology, no comma, and nail technology licensing board, or as uh, the locals call it, the BCBEENTLB -E um, <laughs> requires a year of schooling costing $16,000 or more for, wait for it, permission to braid hair. Um, and that's almost as ridiculous as Tennessee, which requires 300 hours of schooling on, quote, the theory and practice of shampooing before you can do what my four year old figured out how to do two years ago. Um, in DC, uh, in cities like DC, have banned people from giving guided tours, like city tours, like we, you know, when we were outside just a minute ago, we saw these, these folks on segways kind of going around doing a tour of Boston, uh, unless you get a tour guide license, right? And that's just laughable. If a city said, we ban you from selling a tour guide book about the city of DC unless you have a license, you get laughed out of the court. But suddenly you call it an occupational license, and the city gets carte blanche to, to regulate it and ban it, right? Uh, in Louisiana, there's a small group of licensed florists that get to decide if anyone else is allowed to be a florist and compete with them. Um, it's actually harder to pass the licensed florist exam in Louisiana than it is to pass the Louisiana bar exam, um, which is just insane. Um, and, and I laugh, um, and we all laugh at that, 
But IG actually had a client, uh, 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 an African-American widow named Sandy Meadows, who lost her job uh, as a florist because she didn't have a license. And tragically, she passed away before a court could vindicate her constitutional right to earn a living. And that list goes on and on and on. But we are here to talk about Texas. Um, and I want to introduce you to a guy named Ash Patel. He is like the quintessential entrepreneur's entrepreneur. Uh, he's an immigrant from India, and he came to America, into Texas in particular, because he heard this is a place where you can earn an honest living if you work hard enough. So Mr. Patel opened a small business that provides uh, eyebrow threading. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Eyebrow threading. Have you seen that, like in a mall kiosk? Okay, a handful of you do. So let me explain what it is. So eyebrow threading is, you know, a grooming technique that's maybe a thousand years old, right? It comes from the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, the, the groomer uses a cotton thread, and that's it, nothing else, to shape and remove eyebrow hair, right? So they kind of, um, I, I like this newspaper's description of it. Quote, uh, threaders, quote, play the part of cosmetic cowboys lassoing out each hair <laughs> with the looped ends of the thread, right? So you just pitch it out, a little tiny lasso, you tie it around the hair, you pluck it out, right? Um, so Ash Patel's eyebrow threading business just takes off. Um, but cosmetologists also provide eyebrow grooming, except they do it differently. They do waxing, they do plucking, they do pick any other type of medieval torture method that's so incredibly painful. Um, and they were not particularly pleased with the competition that eyebrow threading was providing. Um, so, surprise, the Texas Department of, of Licensing and Regulation suddenly decides that threading is dangerous at the same time that cosmetologists start complaining about competition. You do the math about why they suddenly decided it's dangerous. Um, so the, the department takes the position that you can't thread eyebrows unless you have a cosmetology license. Okay. So what do you need to get a cosmetology license? Well, first of all, the coursework for a license costs between $7,000 and $22,000 to get a cosmetology license. And it requires anywhere between 750 and 1,500 hours of training depending on the specific license. Um, so cosmetology school teaches you lots of things like, like um, hair waxing, um, makeup application, chemical peels, um, and I'm not making this up, <laughs> a mandatory 10-hour course on color psychology. Um, but, you, even though you learn about color psychology and other, other things, the one thing you don't learn in those 1,500 hours, you don't learn anything about eyebrow threading, right? So Texas is saying to be an eyebrow threader, you have to spend $22,000 to learn to do something you're not actually going to do, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so uh, Texas threatens Mr. Patel and says, you know, we're going to start fining you daily fines unless you either get a license or shut down your business. So he shuts down his business. But he wasn't alone. Um, uh, with all the zeal you'd expect for a serial killer manhunt, the state of Texas aggressively hunted down threaders throughout the state. And you have to understand who most of these threaders were. Most of these threaders are immigrants, stay-at-home moms, who have one marketable skill, that's eyebrow threading, it's a way they're putting dinner on the table, often they're, 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 um, they're single moms, and these are the types of individuals that Texas went after. Um, Okay, so I think that a lot of us would agree that uh, regulations for eyebrow threading are stupid, but uh, Justice Scalia, who I very much admire, used to say that he wished he had a stamp um, that, that would read stupid but constitutional, right? And so anytime somebody complained about a stupid law, he'd stamp it, stupid but constitutional. And so the question is, should threading regulations be left to the democratic process? Or what's the constitutional argument why this is wrong? Well. The purpose of a constitution is to limit the government's power to interfere with our liberties. First come rights, and then comes government. And the Texas Constitution has an important provision in Article 1, Section 19, and I'm going to read it to you. No citizen of this state shall be deprived of life, liberty, property, privileges or immunities, or in any manner disenfranchised, except by the due course of the law of the land. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Does that sound like something else you've heard? Um, for those of you who are not 1Ls, you'll learn about the 14th Amendment, and it sounds very much like the 14th Amendment, because it was modeled on the 14th Amendment, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about the 14th Amendment. Um, Southern landowners tried to circumvent the 13th Amendment's ban on slavery by passing what are referred to as black codes. Uh, now, black codes did things like, let me give you South Carolina as, as an example. In South Carolina, um, the black codes required uh, blacks to sign labor contracts requiring them to live on the employer's property, 
um, to pay rent uh, in the place that they're required to live. It capped their wages. Um, uh, some other examples of, of the South Carolina uh, black codes, they, they banned blacks from owning firearms, from selling alcohol. Um, actually, they banned them from selling any farm pr products that they own without the consent of, the, uh, of their white employers. And blacks were barred from practicing any occupation except farmer without a license from a judge, right? So that's what happened in the South. And there's a very strong historical record that the Congress that passed the 14th Amendment was trying to protect the right to earn an honest <coughs> living for former slaves and, and Union soldiers living in the South who were also targeted by, by similar statutes. And uh, this right to earn a, a living was widely considered an inalienable privilege or immunity. Um, of course, that was the idea. Uh, for those of you who have not yet taken the full constitutional history course, uh, spoiler alert, there are these cases called the Slaughterhouse Cases that basically write the Privileges and Immunities Clause out of the Constitution, right? Um, but something interesting happens three years after the Supreme Court says, no, the federal Constitution isn't going to protect this right to earn a living. Um, and Texas passes its own version of the Privileges and Immunities Clause in 1876. So Mr. Patel and uh, his co-plaintiffs argue that Texas's eyebrow threading regulations violate Section 19 because they deprive the right of Texans to practice their chosen profession, profession free from undue government inf interference. So how do you decide if government interference is undue, if it goes too far, right? Um, well, IJ argued that under the Constitution, threading regulations could only be upheld if Texas could show that it had a legitimate purpose for regulating eyebrow threading, like there's a good reason to do it, and that the threading regulation actually advanced um, that legitimate objective. So that's what IJ said should be the test for whether or not you violate the Constitution. Um, so what standard did, this, did the state of Texas say applies? Well, Texas said that the federal rational basis test should apply. Now, for those of you who are 1Ls and haven't heard about this yet, um, the rational basis test is a creature of the New Deal era progressive justices who were hell-bent on upholding the new administrative state in spite of long-settled constitutional limits. So under federal rational basis review, an economic regulation is upheld so long as there's any remotely rational explanation for the regulation. And bizarrely, the Supreme Court says judges should invent patently false hypothetical explanations if the government can't come up with a rationale on its own. Um, now, in contrast for what are called fundamental rights, uh, basically non-economic rights, the court applies a much stricter standard, which we call strict scrutiny. Um, so the progressives built a hierarchy of constitutional rights that conveniently places economic rights on the bottom of the pile. So I happen to think that this hierarchy of rights is constitutionally indefensible under the Ninth Amendment. If you've got your pocket constitution on you, you can open up to the Ninth Amendment, or I've got like 30 copies in my bag. Um, and it says that the enumeration of certain rights may not be construed to, quote, deny or disparage unenumerated rights like economic liberties. Um, and that sure sounds to me like judges are all obliged to construe all rights equally. Um, but even if you don't buy the Ninth Amendment argument, um, I think it's also fundamentally incompatible with the centuries-old tradition of the judicial duty that predates the founding and was incorporated into Article 3. Well, let's suppose you're drafting a sort of model code for judges. I just want to ask, like, when you think of what a judge should be, what are some of the first things that come to mind? Like, how should a judge act? Objective. Objective, okay, what else? Any other words come to mind? Knowledgeable. Knowledgeable, that's good. I like that, that would be nice. <laughs> um, uh, what about independent, right? Um, you know, I think three of the things that come to mind for me is you want a judge who's not going to pick sides, right? Who's objective, um, is not going to, you know, is going to weigh the arguments equally on both sides. You want a judge who's going to apply the law and not their own preferences. That seems like a good idea. And you want judges with backbone to actually uphold the law even when they're facing criticism. So it turns out that this is a pretty ancient idea stretching back centuries before uh, the, uh, the founding. Philip Hamburger is this brilliant scholar who has this book on judicial duty, and he says that it was well understood among the common law judges of England that they must be both impartial and implacable. And that meant inval even if it meant invalidating property of the king. And think about that. In the 1600s, if you're a judge in the 1600s, and uh, you're telling the king you can't do that, you've got to have some guts. But they did it, right? And that's part of our tradition. In fact, in Federalist 78, 
Uh, Hamilton says something that a lot of you have heard of. It says, he says that the judicial branch is the least dangerous branch. Um, and everybody remembers that phrase, but nobody remembers his caveat. He says that it's the least dangerous branch to the threats of the rights of the people only so long as the judiciary remains independent of the other branches. He says, liberty can have nothing to fear from the judiciary alone, but liberty would have everything to fear if the judiciary were to unite with the other branches. So once the judiciary abandons its role as an objective arbiter and suddenly picks sides and starts systematically favoring the government over the people, then you have everything to fear from the judiciary instead of nothing to fear from the judiciary. And that's the problem with the, the rational basis test and doctrines like Chevron deference. You cannot square them with this basic duty of judicial independence. It just can't be done. You're having a judge who takes off the umpire's mask and instead puts on the government's jersey and pinch hits for the government in these cases. And, and that's the choice. And, and when faced with this choice between the federal rational basis test or the more demanding standard that I just said is required by the Texas Constitution, the Texas Supreme Court decided 6-3 that Mr. Patel and I do were right. Um, and you have to read this opinion. It's a, it's a great example of originalism in action. And by that I mean the court really digs into the historical record. They really want to understand what the public meaning of Article I, Section 19 was, and the purpose of that, and what it was intended to protect. And the Texas Supreme Court explicitly rejects the federal version of the rational basis test for economic liberty challenges. Um, now, uh, there's, uh, I, I kind of want to um, end here talking a little bit about you know, why we should care. Because um, you may be thinking that's great and all, but this is about eyebrow threading. The stakes aren't really that high. Um, so maybe Mr. Patel has to get a license, maybe he doesn't. Why does Patel matter beyond eyebrow threading? Um, and I think the answer is in Justice Willett's concurrence in the opinion. And Justice Willett actually, Brantley Starr's uh, former boss, um, he has a, a really beautiful concurrence that I wish you know, they handed out to every Texas law student on their first day of law school. He says, this case is fundamentally about the American dream and the unalienable human right to pursue happiness without curtsying to the government on bended knee. It's about whether government can connive with rent-seeking factions to ration liberty unrestrained and whether judges must submissively uphold even the most risible encroachments. And I think Texans should be proud that under your constitution, Texans live under a presumption of liberty rather than a presumption of restraint. I think Texans should be proud that when it mattered, Texas justices had the Constitution, help, help, upheld the Constitution, um, the Texas Constitution. And I'll tell you, um, uh, the rest of the country is watching and looking at Patel, and they're talking about it, right? And you've got, you know, California style cynical progressives who are sneering at the Texas Supreme Court and just waiting for Texas courts to backtrack. They're waiting and they're expecting. Texas courts to decide this is a huge mistake, and just like Lochner, they're waiting for Texas to backtrack. Other states, there are judges in Florida that I know are looking at it and saying, you know, is this the model for us to prevent Californication in our own state, right? Is this how we get back on track to prevent economic liberties? The, the country is watching, and I think that Texas really sets a, uh, an important example. Um, Justice Willett um, starts with a quote from Frederick Douglass uh, that I think is absolutely beautiful. And, where Frederick Douglass is talking about how it felt the first day he got to keep money that he earned with his two hands, with his own two hands. And he says, Frederick Douglass writes, to understand the emotion which swelled my heart as I clasped this money, really realizing that I had no master who could take it from me, that it was mine, that my hands were my own and could earn more of the precious coin. I was not only a freeman, but a free working man, and no master Hugh stood ready at the end of the week to seize my hard earnings. That's the right that the Texas Constitution protects, and Texas judges are duty bound to uphold it. Okay, so Brantley Starr from the Attorney General's Office. I lose all of Sheldon's cases. Uh, but uh, you came here looking for a debate. Let me start off with that. Uh, but add to that. <laughs> I know we've had this debate for how many years now since Clark Neely's book came out? Has it been a decade? Uh, it seems like a decade. Four years? Four years? Yeah. In dog years, that's well over a decade. Yeah. And so um, we've been having this debate, and it is a fascinating one. Um, 
But uh, what I want to start off with is just highlighting some of these points of agreement that um, Sheldon and I have. And I have nothing but high respect for IJ and all of my friends who share the exact same views that, that Sheldon and IJ have. Um, three principles you probably picked up on from Sheldon that are just core bedrock principles that we all agree on regardless of where we are on the spectrum. One is holding government accountable. Um, I, I've been in charge of suing the federal government 34 times in the last two and a half years. Um, we're equal opportunity, so I've also sued local governments almost 10 times uh, for doing the same violations of law that we've been trying to hold the federal government accountable for. So it's not just a Texas versus the feds thing. It's, it's about good government as a whole. One of the good government as a whole aspects that Sheldon mentioned is agency deference. And y'all are probably all familiar, at least, in name with the concept, right? The concept is that there's an ambiguous law. The courts are going to defer to the agency, the state or federal level agency, as to what they think that really means. And there's now a more robust understanding, thanks in large part to Justice Gorsuch, assuming his position on the court, that really what that doctrine is on agency deference is an abdication of the judicial duty. As we all know from Marbury, hopefully you've covered it so far, that it's only the province of the judiciary to say what the law is. And so when the courts say it's the province of the agency to say what this ambiguous law is, that, that's in tension with Marbury. A third thing that we really fundamentally agree on is that overregulation in its economic forms are sinister. And where we disagree is where you should fix it. And so that's what I want to focus in on, but let me start off with a story of my own. It is a little bit close to the eyebrow threading concept. Um, my dad is a barber, and so in his barber shop when I was growing up, um, I remember in my teenage years, he would get visits and frequent calls from our um, Texas Barber Board. It didn't have the heinously long name that, uh, that was it Idaho or Utah? Utah yeah. had. Um, but in Texas at the time, we had a Barber Board and a Cosmetology Commission. We had two <coughs> separate agencies who were in charge of licensing those occupations. And my dad is a barber. He ran a barber shop at the barber pool up front. And he employed a cosmetologist, which was his first son, that would um, give you a shave if you were a man with a straight razor. And that was his second son. And so the barber board came after him because they said it is solely the province of the barber board to allow someone to shave with a straight razor below the lower lobe of the ear. And so we got fined about $1,000 a day because of this fight between barbers and cosmetologists on who owns what territory um, on a person's face. It's very strange. Um, and so I remember, you know, I, I didn't get my college paid for because of economic overregulation. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I have a interest in assuring that we don't have economic overregulation because my family saw that person and didn't pay for it. Um, but the model that I would propose to you, that I would prefer we address this overregulation from, is in the legislature. And I'll give you an example of how my dad's scenario worked out. The legislature has seen that we have these boards of barbers that regulate barbers. And so what do you want to do as soon as you climb to the top of some spot? To pull the ladder up, right? And so if you've gotten to be a barber, then you want it to be really hard for the next person to get to be a barber. And then you're insulating yourself from competition. And so the legislature has seen this over time. They've set up something called Sunset Commission. They review all these agencies. And Sunset took those two warring boards and said, you know what, we're killing both of you and putting you into one big group called the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation that will regulate all of this. And so we won't have as many barbers fighting cosmetologists and cosmetologists fighting barbers. That doesn't solve every problem because Patel had to sue the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. Right. Sometimes they still make poor decisions, and they overregulate the heck out of you. Um, it does help to solve some of those problems when we stop having a framework where we have barbers, regular barbers, doctors, doctors, dentists, dentists. But I would submit to you that the legislature is the place we should be fixing as much of this overregulation as we possibly can. We know from reading the first three articles of the U.S. Constitution, from reading the first four or five of the Texas Constitution, that really these policy level decisions our founders wanted to be shoved into the legislative process. Because we can have committee hearings and weigh testimony and hear all sorts of facts in the legislative process that you really can't get to in a court record, especially a record that's up on appeal to a high court. There are flaws in that process too. And I'll submit to you that in the legislative process, when you come out and say, you know what, we're going to take over the Barker Board and we're going to change how they regulate. All the barbers get ticked off. 
and they show up at the ledge. And our legislative process is one that's not designed to pass bills easily at the end of the day. It's one that's designed to kill bills. And when you have a bill start off that says, let's bring in Barbara Gordon cosmetology and combine them, and then all the barbers and cosmetologists show up and say, don't, we still want to regulate ourselves, it's hard for that bill to pass. But I would submit to you that if we bypass that legislative process and go to the courts, we start teaching the legislature what a new normal can be. And it's that on these tough issues where we hear all these people who don't want you to pass this bill because this bill helps me the way I am now protect my income. If we give them that pass, then they learn the new normal bill by bill that dies. And then when it comes time to fix some of the overregulation that they really need to be fixing or addressing some of the other tough issues of our day, they understand the new normal. And they understand that if we just give them a pass, maybe the courts will fix it and clean it up on the back end. What I would say is that the way in which IJ has approached this, I believe, is the right way to do it. You haven't seen them arguing that under um, today, at least under the, under the federal due process clause, we should shove as many rights in there as we possibly can. And I think if we did that, we would have another prudential concern with the courts, right? Because then we're essentially allowing judges carte blanche authority to make up whatever rules and rights they want to. Instead, you've seen them uh, talk about the slaughterhouse cases. You recall that privileges and immunities clause on a federal constitutional level that's gutted in the slaughterhouse cases, but gutted in a way where the court said, hey, well, these substantive rights really belong with the states. Let the states create them. And so then you've seen after that, Texas said, okay, we're going to create it. We have a clause in the Constitution, and then we have a large grant of positive rights from our state statutes. So if we're having this discussion, I love the idea that we're having it on the state level, which is where it should be rather than giving judges who have lifetime tenure carte blanche authority to create whatever rights they want to, and those rights are insulated from your view from the legislative body after that. I would say that there are a few other areas where we can think of that I think court challenges are really appropriate to try to help us constrain some of this regulation that exists. And as a side note, I think there are federal constitutional provisions that judges are meant to fully engage on. I think the due process clause, it means process, not substance. But if someone is deprived of their notice and opportunity to be heard, judges should engage. On the Commerce Clause, there's a material limit we know from Lopez and Morrison. Judges should engage on the Commerce Clause. On equal protection, as Justice Gorsuch said in his confirmation hearings, that's one of the most radical grants of affirmative right that we've ever seen in any constitution. And judges should engage there. But there's, there's some more interesting law that allows engagement on economic overregulation at our state level. And it's a, it's a different flavor to it altogether. It's not a Patel due process kind of argument. It's an antitrust argument. And I want to just give you a, a snapshot of it and not dwell on it. One of the few things that I agree that the Obama era Department of Justice did was to bring some economic overregulation cases under the antitrust laws on the federal level. There's a case called North Carolina Dental. The North Carolina Dental Board basically was cracking down on teeth whitening by non-dentists, right? Because once you become a dentist, you don't want anyone else to interfere with what you're doing. And so the Obama era DOJ took this and said, basically, this is not North Carolina acting against teeth whitening. It's dentists acting against non-dentists. And so because of that, you really don't have antitrust protection if you're dentists regulating dentists. If you're the state regulating dentists, have that. That's public safety. Go for it. And so the Supreme Court took the case and they found that there wasn't antitrust immunity because it really was a structure. A majority of this commission was dentists and they were regulating in a very protectionist way. And so they used that process to go through the courts to scare the bejesus out of these board members who are regulating their own profession and they're pulling up the ladder and engaging in protectionistic behavior. We've seen cases like that hit close to home in Texas. My office has defended the Texas Medical Board. Texas Medical Board passed a rule on telemedicine. You know, the app Teledoc, right, where you can communicate with your doctor or another doctor from scratch uh, to get a diagnosis of your condition. Well, the Medical Board, doctors regulating doctors, doctors passed a rule on telemedicine that basically cracked down on that and prevented it in a meaningful way. The lawsuit resulted that followed on with the North Carolina dental case. And as that was going on, our legislature actually did the right thing. And before there was actually a court judgment against the Medical Board, they went and took the telemedicine rules, changed them, put them in a form that they said, okay, 
This is the way in which we're going to handle public safety with telemedicine for the state of Texas. Pass that rule as revised. And then it's the state of Texas saying, here's how we're doing telemedicine. Then it's not doctors regulating doctors, it's Texas regulating doctors. And if we don't give the legislature a pass, but we bring in those tough issues, then I think we can have a body that deliberates and functions as it should, and then we can have the court as a backstop for those clauses where they really do have a meaningful role in judicial engagement. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly, and I'll just stay sitting here, actually. I thought that was, that was very great. Thank you, Brantley, for um, uh, some very kind words about IJ. Very excited about that. And like I said, you know, um, we've litigated jointly with the Texas AG's office on a lot of federal government overreach, and they are fantastic partners in defending states' rights. Uh, and you, you can't find better partners among the states in, in uh, combating, combating federal overreach like that. Um, and, and I think, as, uh, as Brantley said, there are a lot of areas where we continue to agree. Um, there are kind of five points that I quickly wanted to, to touch on. Um, you know, Brantley's overarching argument is that as much as possible, we should let the legislature do this. We should let the legislature fix these problems. And in the abstract, I, I don't disagree with that. You know, if the legislature can fix these type of issues, that's fantastic. But uh, you know who wouldn't be surprised to find out that the legislature doesn't fix these problems and, in fact, exacerbates them? A guy named James Madison, right? Um, James Madison, uh, before the Constitutional Convention, was trying to figure out what went wrong with the Art Articles of Confederation. And he wrote this memo to himself that's deliciously titled On the Vices of the Political System of the United States. Right? And, um, and he's trying to figure out what the principal vice was that caused the Articles of Confederation to collapse. And he presents this simple but powerful hypothetical. He says, okay, imagine you have three people, and two of them have rights, have interests, which are opposed to the rights of the third, or the interests of the third. Um, in a purely democratic system, what's going to happen to the rights of the third person? He said, every single time, the same thing will happen. The two individuals will vote in such a way to deprive the rights of the third. And he had a very practical reason for caring about this hypothetical. One of the reasons that the Articles of Confederation collapsed is precisely because you saw this happening again and again. Um, during that period, kind of like today, debtors far outnumbered creditors. So when debtors were going to uh, the legislature, what were they doing? They were getting legislation passed to wipe away their, their debts, which uh, hurt the economic liberties of the creditors. Right? And so Madison was trying to figure out how do we prevent this type of thing from happening? How can we make sure that we have a political system that derives its legitimacy from the consent of the government, a democratic process, but at the same time protect the rights of, of minorities. Um, and the solution that we chose for the federal system, and it's the same solution for the, the state system, is separation of powers. We have an executive branch, a, a, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch whose duty is to say what the law is. And James Madison said that the courts would absolutely need to be the, the defenders of liberty against the encroachment of the majority on the rights of, of the minority. In fact, he called it the, the, a, a democracy by, um, uh, uncontrolled by the apprehensions of the majority. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a great idea, but it's an idea that um, our, our founding fathers considered and said we need to have some sort of safety valve, and that's what the courts are for. Um, and particularly in a place like Texas, where the legislature meets, meets every two years, I mean, I know you know that like, the legislative agenda at the beginning of the session immediately crumbles and you get like two or three things done. Um, and there's just no way that eyebrow threading moves up to the priority list um, on the Texas legislative agenda when you've got like the Texas school system collapsing and you've got you know the bathroom bill and everything like that. <laughs> Compare that to eyebrow threading and ain't no way Ash Patel is getting his rights vindicated. So I, I, I agree in principle, but the Constitution provides a system to protect the rights of, of individuals and it's through the courts. Um, now, I think uh, Brantley has a good point that there is a concern that if the courts are always stepping in, then the legislature will kind of take a back seat and say, hey, this is how the world works now. We can just wait for the courts to fix it. Uh, and, and that's problematic, right? But I don't think that the fact that the legislature is abdicating its constitutional responsibilities to only pass constitutional legislation should be an excuse for the judiciary to then abdicate its judicial duty to uphold the Constitution. 
Um, the, just kind of the, the last point, I thought it was a, a really interesting point. Um, uh, Rantley said, you know, a lot of these can be addressed through antitrust challenges, right, through antitrust law. Um, you know, I kind of have a front, uh, I had a front seat to uh, a challenge like this when I was at the U.S. Chamber. The U.S. Chamber sued the city of Seattle uh, invoking antitrust laws for a Seattle ordinance that uh, was basically designed to ban Uber in the city of Seattle. And the way it worked was this. Um, Uber drivers are independent contractors, right? Uh, now, the, the national labor laws allow employees to unionize together, to form a union, and to collectively bargain with employers. But the labor laws don't give you an antitrust exemption if you're an independent contractor. So Seattle uh, passes this law that says, okay, independent contractors can, can unionize, right? Um, they can basically get together to fix prices to, uh, to try and block uh, Uber from operating in the city. Um, so the chamber brought an antitrust challenge, and you're right, the FTC sometimes will step in, and sometimes will bring antitrust challenges to, to, to deal with kind of this crony capitalism type stuff and, and out of control cities. Um, but where was the FTC in that Seattle case? Uh, they were surprisingly absent, even though I think that their positions in cases like the, the dentistry case were absolutely aligned. I think it's probably because of interest groups, right? Labor union interest groups and other interest groups who who you know, got the FTC to stand down. So you can't depend on federal regulators to be the ones that are protecting our rights. Um, and that's not the way our system was designed. Um, as, as much as that might be a possible vehicle in certain circumstances, at the end of the day, I'm a Madisonian Republican, small r Republican. I'm a Madisonian to the, to the extent that I think that there is a problem, an inherent vice in the political system where the rights of a minority will be overrun by the majority, and the way that we protect that, the way we've decided to protect that is through the courts. Just very quickly in rebuttal, uh, I won't step up either. I think that um, you made a very fair point on if the legislature has has engaged in unconstitutional behavior, you should be able to, to vindicate your, your rights. And I am in complete agreement there. I, I would prefer to give the leg legislature a chance to look at what they have done in an unconstitutional manner. And Arif and I have had discussions on, okay, you want to tell, what are the next 20 things that after you want to tell you should win, that I can go tell the ledge, hey, you're gonna lose these 20 lawsuits, right? And so th when, when we start engaging in dialogue like that, then our legislature can start thinking in the proper constitutional construct, and that's one thing our office has been working on heavily over the last couple of years in areas that are even broader than occupational licensing. They tend to work in ways that try to see what the legislative process brings out, but when we know they're going to get sued one way or another, at the end of the day, we try to help them um, be abreast of what the litigation stance is and how they can be in the right constitutional mindset to where every one of those cases will win because we did the right and constitutional thing at the end of that process. Um, on antitrust, I know that's a, a bit of a tangent, but I would say that in the, in the telemedicine case that we had in Texas, the aggrieved person actually can sue directly for the antitrust violation. And we were talking to the FTC as part of that process, but it was really a private plaintiff driven case. And so I think that's, that's a more robust and meaningful tool that, that we should be examining. And in Texas, we've been having conversations with our agencies before they get sued. When we see some of this uh, overregulation that they've done by rule, not just by statute, and saying, mm, based on Patel, based on North Carolina Dental, let's think about this. Uh, because you may actually have personal individual liability for that protections decision you just engaged in. And those are things that happen behind the scenes. You'll never see a lawsuit, you'll never see a news article, but you'll see some boards quietly changing positions because um, we don't sue our clients that we represent. We sue the feds, we sue the locals, but not our clients. But we do try to get them to think constitutionally. If you want to give me a list of those that you think are going to get sued, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, uh, while I'm here. And at the end of the day, if they don't change course and you sue and win, then uh, we just funded you out of their agency budget. So for you, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. But I would say that you know, if you're a 1L sitting here today, and this is your first time to engage on this debate, I think um, over the last four years since Clark Neely's book came out, we probably had a number of people who have misconstrued the positions as being more polar opposite than they are. And so, uh, you know, if you can drill down and understand the refined ideas that Sheldon's talking about, this isn't federal immune judges who can do whatever they want. This is a principle, Texas due course of law under the privileges and immunities clause, um, trying to enforce a constitutional bound. And then our office, where on the other end, um, 
you heard Shelby Saltz on a rational basis scrutiny and that you can trip and fall over the line, it's so easy, and that even judges can make up reasons when the state can't. On our office, we try to make an exhaustive list of reasons and make sure that the, that list makes sense. We just won a case in the Fifth Circuit recently on um, tuition benefits for veterans, and it was a rational basis test. We came up with five very compelling reasons, um, even though we didn't have to compel uh, you know, anything at all. And so we have this view of good government on the inside, even though there's a V that separates this. Our view is, is narrower than you might think as well. And so I, I would urge you to try to understand the views in as great a depth as you can to understand where you come out and what your role should be. And I would submit that your role should be um, helping in some way, helping Sheldon sue us or helping us ward off the suit before the suit comes. Right, because we all have the same shared goal. And so if you, if you study this and you realize that you have a conviction, try to realize where your role is. Time for questions. Does anybody have any questions for our speakers? Sheldon and I can ask questions of you if you don't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I would urge you to ask questions. I love the Socratic method. I have just a small one to clarify how they brought eyebrow threading back, back under it. Who, who, what did it say? Who decided that eyebrow threading fell, fell under the, uh, the board when it hadn't previously been there? I'm trying to so so the, uh, the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, kind of, I wouldn't say out of the blue, contemporaneously with cosmetologists complaining about eyebrow threading competition, the Texas Department of, Regula of Licensing and Regulation said, okay, we think eyebrow threading ought to be covered by the cosmetology license. So it was that Texas department that decided to go after the eyebrow threaders, right? Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. A couple of times you talked about the Constitution or how the state constitutions are framed by the federal constitution. And just as a, a one L who's like being used a lot, how important is the constitution in all other realms of law? I guess that's the question for both of you. Is it something that you think about? in terms of like explaining just other, like maybe more local laws, is the Constitution relevant? So basically, how often does the Constitution come into play in kind of the day-to-day -day job of being a lawyer? Depends on what type of lawyer you are. Like for us, probably like every day. Yeah, not, yeah. 90, 95 percent of the day. Uh, um, so if you like constitutional law, come talk to me after. Or uh, me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Start a bidding war. We keep we can't pay a lot, but now, they're nonprofit, so yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not you're talking about the two lowest paying of the three sectors in society, right? Now. <laughs> but that's why we have the good work, right? Yeah, but I, I will I will um, if I can take an indulgence here. You go to go to my Twitter account at Sheldon Gilbert, and the pin tweet is how you can uh, win a free trip to Washington D.C. Um, come visit us at IJ. Come see a Supreme Court argument with us. And all you got to do is sign up for a newsletter we have called Short Circuit. We read thousands of circuit court opinions every year, 6,000 last year, and then we summarize in kind of short, pithy, irreverent descriptions the most interesting opinions. So sign up for our newsletter to learn about really fun cases, and you can, win, uh, and, and you can have a chance to win a trip to Washington, D.C. Come see a, an oral argument with us. Come, uh, come hang out with us at, at IJ and learn a little bit more about suing the government. <laughs> can you offer that? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, yes, because if you want to sue other forms of government, if you want to help state agencies understand their constitutional role, you can win a trip to me. If you want to sue the feds, <laughs> or a win an all expenses paid trip to Austin. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, your question is is a good one because in law school you study constitutional law and then you go out and practice law and never get to touch it again. But it was one of the most fascinating things you you discussed in law school. And so I would submit to you that if that is one of your goals, really do intern for one or both of our organizations. We'll just have to scrum you off the cases you worked on that are on the other side of the V and, and come, come learn constitutional law with us. It's a fascinating endeavor and one that folks outside of our organizations simply don't get to touch that often. Uh, the reality is that law school doesn't prepare you for 95% of legal careers, right? So um, you go to law school and you learn about mostly about litigation in federal courts, appeals courts, that's kind of the whole model. Um, you know, there are transactional attorneys, there are compliance attorneys, there are litigation attorneys. The overwhelming majority of attor attorneys aren't litigators. And of those who are litigators, 90% of lawsuits, civil lawsuits, never go to trial. So you're not like a trial attorney that you see on TV, right? You're just like going back and forth and negotiating settlements. And then, uh, and then of those 10% that go to appeal, like the, the fraction of people that are, you know, Supreme Court lawyers, 
um, at the in, in Washington D.C. There's like you know maybe 30 lawyers who regularly practice before the Supreme Court of the I don't know how many of the army of millions of lawyers. Um, uh, so it, this is give you a skewed perspective. But you know who has a path to doing those? Well, we both do, right? Um, so if this is the type of stuff that uh, that you think is uh, passionate for you, let us know. Any more questions? Uh, I did, unless somebody else has a question. <laughs> I'm really worried. Uh, <laughs> I want Brentley uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Attorney General's practice of suing federal government. Because, uh, you know, uh, Governor Abbott, when he was Attorney General, he was famous for saying, you know, I wake up, have coffee, sue the government, right? <laughs> the next day I wake up, have coffee, sue the government. So, uh, you know, Texas uh, Attorney General's office and, um, you know, our Solicitor General has been in uh, the U.S. Supreme Court quite, quite a bit and in federal courts quite a bit, suing the federal government, and in fact asking the judiciary to be judicially engaged. That's correct. And I, I would submit that, uh, you know, most of our cases have a fairly clear line in them, and most of them, even though they have sort of constitutional underpinnings, really the courts only ever get to a federal law component first, and that's the Administrative Procedure Act, which is really boring for most people. But um, for you students, and even if you practice law for a while, you probably don't realize what a radical grant of liberty authority the Federal Administrative Procedure Act is. Um, if you're aggrieved by an agency's final agency action, you can sue them. In federal court, on the state level, we don't nearly have that. Ninety percent of the time, you lose, but you can't. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, and we were trying to improve our batting average, uh, and so we, we we improved it over time. But I would say, on the state level, there's really not that kind of robust ability to bring a state actor into court, which is why, on the state level, we've been trying to work behind the scenes on getting them into compliance, knowing that we won't see those lawsuits happen as often, if that makes sense. So we really uh, we do focus on judicial engagement, but there's something to engage on very easily with the Federal Administrative Procedure Act that says you can sue if you're aggrieved by an unlawful rule. And most of our cases, probably 90% of them are that a statute says X and the agency is saying Y. And so we're saying it's unlawful because the agency can't rewrite the rule. So do you think it should be easier to sue the state of Texas for uh, a group? A grievance is kind of like in the federal. I have system. worked with legislators this past session on expanding our Texas APA. And um, any time they do that, then we have to give them an assessment of what the impact is on the state fisc. And so the easy way agencies kill bills like that is to say, oh, it'll cost us, you know, $20 million or $100 million. And we were working with our legislators to say, it'll cost nothing because there's going to be a growing period in the meantime. But after a few months, people will realize they should start acting within their lawful authority and they won't be stupid anymore. And so uh, you'll see that tail drop off, and then agencies are in compliance with the law, and it'll all even out from a fiscal perspective. So again, if we, if we just believe in protectionism for the government, we wouldn't be doing that. But because we believe in good government, we are going out there and trying to work with our legislators on how to craft meaningful accountability legislation. The, um, the former uh, president of the Dallas uh, Reserve Bank, um, he, he, he kind of sees the world, uh, he, he describes it as, you know, the rest of the country has a choice. Are we going to um, Texify the rest of the country, or will the rest of the country go through Californication? That's his phrase. Um, and you know, there's a lot to be said for the robust um, economic liberties and opportunities that are available in Texas, but they're not available everywhere, right? And the fact is, the federal constitution, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, that the slaughterhouse cases you raise, was designed to protect everybody everywhere, not just you know people in Texas. So not everybody has a Texas constitution. Not every state has a Patel, mm -hmm. and we need federal courts to step up and be engaged and actually enforce the Constitution that we have, right, rather than deferring to the government and allowing the government to grow bigger. Uh, I think we can do one more question. Mm -hmm. if not, we can... Oh, you uh, yeah, I, it's not really. Well, with the Chevron uh, deference, um, I forgot, is there a specific case coming up that that's going to be dealt with? Or is it just with Gorsuch um, now on the court, people think that that's going to be that? It's, it's not just Gorsuch. There's not a specific case that uh, asks whether a shower deference is unconstitutional. Um, people are counting the votes on the court and trying to figure out how many votes there are to overrule Chevron deference. And definitely the, the swap of uh, Gorsuch for Scalia changes that calculus with his, his concurring opinion to his own opinion. Uh, it's not just Gorsuch, though. Uh, Judge uh, Janice Rogers Brown in the D.C. Circuit issued kind of a, same, a similar opinion saying Chevron deference is unconstitutional. Judge Ken Jordan in the Third Circuit said 
It's unconstitutional. But the book you should read, it's only 700 pages. It's by Philip Hamburger. It's one of his shorter books. Um, it's called, Is Administrative Law Unlawful? And he makes a 700-page argument that the entire administrative state is unlawful. Um, now, I, there, there's a great case called Abigail Alliance. And it's, uh, Abigail Alliance fights for the rights of terminally ill patients to try experimental drugs, right? The FDA says no, there's no fundamental right to try experimental drugs. Um, so, you know, even though you're going to die regardless, we think we're smarter than you about whether or not you should try a drug that's experimental, right? So Abigail Alliance sued the FDA and goes up to the DC circuit. And there's this fantastic exchange in the oral argument that is just one of those beautiful moments in oral argument history. Um, and the lawyer who's arguing for the federal government says, Your Honor, if we adopt the Abigail Alliance's position and kind of reject rational basis test, then 100 years of the administrative state will collapse. We'll unwind 100 years of the administrative state. And Judge Ginsburg um, leans over, says, there's only so much I can do in one day. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the rest of the judges didn't agree, and Abigail Lyons uh, lost that case. Um, but there's only so much we can do in one day. So it's not going to happen. We're not going to get rid of 100 years of administrative state immediately. But we need judges who are willing to say, you know, this is what the Constitution is intended to protect. Let's actually do it. Oh, one quick point on that. There's, there's a doctrine akin to Chevron deference called our deference, A-U-E-R, and that's where an agency writes an ambiguous rule, and then, according to a Scalia opinion, the agency gets to decide what it means. And before Scalia died, he told Clarence Thomas that was the worst opinion in the history of the court, um, and he wrote it, yeah. so that's amusing. Um, but uh, there is a case up that would call into question whether our is proper. And if I were predicting, I would say that uh, we might not have the votes in the next you know, 20 years to kill Chevron deference, but you might rein it in because there's a step on ambiguity. Is the statute ambiguous? And the Texas Supreme Court started in 2011 reading some robust life into that requirement. And since 2011, they've only found a statute to be ambiguous twice in the Texas Supreme Court. So you can't defer to an agency unless the statute's ambiguous. I think that's where the court will go in the meantime and that you won't have a robust doctrine that you're worried about killing. It will just be a more streamlined doctrine. I'm going to give you a free title for your student notes about this hour case. Um, I'm going to give you a bunch. You can, is, the, is the Supreme Court dour on hour? <laughs> uh, no more hour power. Yeah. Uh, hour deference in the middle of our courts. Uh, there, there are so many opportunities, so have fun. All right. Let's take our